live, as they say. We are All right. Live. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Do Rebel, and welcome to the Jeet Do Dialogues, episode number 265. As you're logging in, if you guys would be kind enough to say where you're logging in from, hit the like button and feel free to continue doing so throughout the dialogue. If you're catching the simulcast over on the YouTube, please be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell as well. Okay. My dialogue partner today needs no introduction unless you're brand new to the Jeet Kune Do world. So let me just tell you that in 1973, Chris Kent was the youngest and the final member admitted into Dan and Asano's famous uh, backyard JKD group. And this was um, during Bruce Lee's lifetime. So Chris Kent, welcome back to the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues. Uh, thanks, Dwight. Um, first, allow me to begin by saying happy birthday. Ah. <laughs> well, yeah, but you have a birthday of sorts tomorrow because for the, so for those who are not good at mass, 1973 was 50 years ago and June 3rd is your, I know, right? Yeah, yeah but you were, you, you, you were a prodigy. You were like five years old. That's right. That's right. That's what I say. <laughs> that's what I say. Yeah, I agree. I yeah. Agree completely. So, so. Uh, all right. So you got to take you got to take us back. Tell us the story of of um, obtaining Inosano. For those who who don't know the story, and then those like me who never tire of hearing it, right? Mm -hmm. Tell the story of of chasing down Inosano's phone number and reaching out mm -hmm. to him and what have you. Well, you know, again, as I've said before, I read I was doing other martial arts at the time. <clears throat> I read two magazine articles, one by Bruce, Liberate Yourself Up from Classical Karate. The other one was Dan's uh, article, Jeet Kune Do's First Powerful and Deceptive. And I thought, wow, you know, I, I, I don't know, something just resonated with me. I'd really like to uh, study this. Black Belt Magazine was, their offices were in Culver City. And I used to go out there and buy magazines from them. So uh, I called them and I, you know, I asked about, you know, Bruce. And they said, well, no, he's in Hong Kong making movies at the time, which I knew, but they just reiterated that. Um, they said that the, I said, well, what about Dan and Asanto? And they said, well, he teaches in his backyard in, in Carson, California. Um, I said, oh, well, you know, can I have his phone number? Do you have his phone number? And they said, no, uh, you can't have it, but it's in the phone book. So I looked it up and sure enough, it was in the phone book. So I called him and, um, you know, again, I, I've, told the story numerous times, but I didn't get to talk to him for the first month because he, at the same time, he was a, a physical education teacher at Malaga Cove Junior High School in Palos Verdes. And then he would go and sometimes teach for Ed Parker, but then he would teach his, his JKD class. So I didn't get to talk to him. I spoke to his uh, wife at the time, Sue, and she would say, call back. And so I would call back. Finally, I spoke to him, and he he said, "Well, look, I only I only take I only teach one class of twelve people. Um, call me back in a week. So one week to the day. I mean, I write it on my calendar. One week to the day, I called him back, and then the same thing. It was like, yeah, well, yeah, I'm not doing anything right now. Call me back in a week, and a week later, I would call him back. And I guess this went on for about a month, and then I don't know. I maybe I wore him down." But um, in the middle of that conversation, he just said, well, I tell you what, why don't you drive down and talk to me tomorrow when the class was going on. So I drove down, met him, sat on uh, these benches while the class was going on at the time for, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half, maybe a little bit longer. And in which he asked me all sorts of questions about my background and, and you know, coming up on my martial art training and then at the end of the, the class and whatever, the interview process, if you will, he just said, okay, do you want to start training? Yeah, you can. You can. Mm -hmm. So, I, of course, I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't do the, the calculations. What day of the week was that? I don't know. I, the classes, as I remember, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay. So it probably was on a Thursday. Okay. All, I do, all I do is, like I said, I can still remember, I can still get the same goosebumps or the feeling that I had at that time when I left and I drove home 
in in my car and it was like oh my god yes <laughs> i kind of, you know i couldn't believe it yeah. um, and then and then about 2 years down the road after training with him i found out from his his wife sue that uh my name was actually 16th on a list there were like 15 people's names ahead of me um who had you know talked about getting in yeah so i don't know call it fate call it god call it destiny i don't know um it happened and yeah. I've, been, I've been blessed so i bet you none of them were teenagers no um everybody was at least 20 years older than me there. right now was that the same situation once you started was everybody still uh 20 years older than you yeah 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 because we only had the one class um i do have to say that dan did start to uh like a teenage beginner class maybe around uh october or something like that that had some people in like friends of mine mark martello he was a teenager you know I, i'm saying i'm 17 and a half well, at the time mm -hmm. uh, mark was i think like 14 or 15 so okay you know um but yes yeah so like i said everybody was was at least 20 years older than me i'd say i don't i don't think i've ever heard of that teenage that uh younger class did it last very long it it went i think until we i, I don't know whether he did it one time a week or or two times a week um but it kind of went on until we opened the, the school you know until we opened the filipino calling academy okay all right. Okay. Well, all right. But yeah, but that's, that's 10 years later. We're not, we're not there yet in the no, history. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So first class, um, if I remember correctly, a lot of, a lot of, um, exercising and then was it sparring? Yeah. Um, the way it, it sort of worked was we warmed up by skipping rope and we always skipped rope to the, the sound theme from, um, Hawaii Five O. So now I, it's like it's like being a punch drum fighter. Every yeah. time I hear the song "Come On," I start skipping rope, even if I don't. <laughs> have rope. So we skipped rope. Um, we we did a lot of equipment training. You know, kicking the kicking shield, hitting the punching the focus gloves, kicking the focus gloves, hitting the heavy bags. That was the prelim that warmed us, you know, warmed us up, if you will, and then spar, and mm -hmm. then. Sparring, you know, so 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 that sparring was it completely what I would call free sparring, or was it specific, like like limited sparring or, or what have you? Um, it was both. Sometimes um, ah. we were limited to such things as lead hand and lead foot only. Other times it was uh, just hands or just feet. Sometimes it was uh, feet versus hands. You know again things things like that yeah but somebody like so because is because you had previous experience there there was like no learning curve it was like just just drop you into the into the middle of it oh yeah yeah straight <laughs> off the, straight off the diving board into, into yeah the deep. you know I, okay. as i said I, i'd done these other martial arts before but nothing had prepared me for it even, even when i even though i'd read about it nothing had prepared me for going in doing this gloving up and yeah and then getting my hat handed to me right yeah because because how do you go from uh, what what could prepare you for example for gloving up and going against somebody like richard bastillo nothing <laughs> nothing <laughs> you know it's like it's like saying what you know what can prepare you for from for jumping out of a, a, an airplane at fifty thousand feet you can mm -hmm. read about it, you can study, you can, you know, maybe jump off of a little tower, but it's a whole different ball game. So yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was a very different ball game. Yeah, at the time, you know. So, okay, so your your classmates, and I mean, mm -hmm. and this is this is just to me, this this is fantastic to be able to call names like Richard Bustillo, Bob mm -hmm. Bremer, uh, yep. Pete Jacobs, yep. Jerry Poteet, Daniel Lee, yep. and, you know, etc as classmates mm -hmm. but they're way older than you yeah, so yeah. Did, did anybody take you on under their wing or was it just like we'll teach this kid 
uh, will, will teach this snotty nose kid a lesson every time he comes to class. It was it was neither of those. Um, nobody <laughs> took me under their wing. They took me under their hook. They took me <laughs> under their cross. They took me under their sidekick. Um, but nobody took me under their wing. And, <laughs> also, and it wasn't the other attitude. There was no attitude of, you know, we're going to teach this, this kid a lesson. They were like, okay, you're in the class. You're a part of the class. You know, th again, these guys were my big brothers. Yeah. And that's the way I look at them at the same time. So I learned a lot from them uh, in all sorts of aspects. Um, but no, they were there to train. And yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I have to say it's funny because, you know, I hear, I've heard stuff through the years, you know, different comments about who's done what. And, you know, I mean, I've had, I've had stuff thrown out, oh, this guy never did this and this guy never did that. And the, the funny thing is, is the people that make the statements, A, were never there, half of them right. weren't even alive at the time. Yeah. And B, I mean, who cares? Their point is mute because it holds no validity. Um, yeah, the, you know, I gloved up for, for months with Daniel Lee, welterweight boxing champion of China or a boxing champion of China, you know, Richard Bastillo, Bob Bremer, who was kind of like the enforcer, as, as Tim, Tim Taggart likes to say. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I said. So who care? I have no, no concern over what anybody else says because I was there at the time. Even yeah. even the comments by most of the people were like people who joined four years after I'd been training. So, but no, these these guys these guys were good. They 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 did it because they loved it, mm -hmm. um, and that's just the way it was, you know. Yeah, yeah. You 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 said you talked about learning lessons um, in different aspects, which is quite coincidental because in my notes, that was what I had planned to ask you about the physical lessons learned and whether or not there were there beyond physical, were there, I don't know, spiritual lessons, life lessons or, or anything from the, from your big brothers? Um, yeah. In, in, in some things, very, very basic. I mean, you know, most of the spiritual, the mental, the emotional stuff um, came from, from my own research that I did. But yeah, when, you know, when, when you're growing up and, and this is why, you know, I refer to these, these guys as Richard. If I'm talking with, with people who are, are, are Sifu or Guru Richard Bastillo students, I try to remember to say Guru, you know, and, and I always preface it by there's no disrespect to them, yeah. you know, yeah. um, but I grew up knowing them as, Richard and, mm -hmm. and Daniel Lee and and none of these other terms. Um, even my own teacher, even Dan, you yeah. know, I, I referred to him a lot of times as Sifu Dan in the class or Sifu and out of the class, but many times it was Dan. So um so got, what I learned from guys like Richard and and and, and Daniel Lee and, and Bob was again, you don't get the resolve without doing the work. And these guys had done the work. Mm -hmm. So um, those were the kind of life lessons I learned. I, and, and, you know, um, I've said it before, because of wearing braces for, you know, whatever, like two and a half years, when I started training, when I punched, I used to look away because I was forever being told, don't get hit in the mouth. Do not, you know, it costs a lot of money. We worked yeah. hard for it. So I had that that kind of attitude and you know as, as i always say that i learned very quickly that the idea that if, if i can't see them i won't get hit does not work <laughs> and, and so um you know the lessons were you know like like richard Bastillo, you know rich you go boom i do something you go chris keep your hands up boom you know like boom keep your hands up bam <laughs> boom, you know keep your hands up so yeah. I learned things like that, and I learned yeah. the the um, the dint of hard work that you know that you've got to work for it, stuff yeah. like that. Did, did uh, can you remember like any conversations about? Because I think, as you're well known for saying, JKD is an experiential process or something like that. Mm -hmm. do, do you remember any conversations about 
each other's process and, and where where people were um, in, in the, the stages of their development or anything like that? No, we, we really didn't go into depth on that. Most of us just get their work out. Um, we, I actually learned more about, oftentimes, and again, this is something I've said through the years, oftentimes I learn more about G. Kondo being at, at, at dinner or at lunch with Dan or right. at, at, with Richard. And, and we had these amazing parties at the time, be it at Richard's house, be it at Dan's house, where, you know, we'd be there with our spouses, our girlfriends, our wives or whatever, and all the guys would be outside. Mm -hmm. And it was just this constant uh, feedback loop of, you know, thoughts and ideas and, and, and things like that. Um, you know, this was a time when when we would have, we would go to a party at, at Dan's house and the party would go on till like 2, 2.30 in the morning and Dan would say, hey, look, man, I'm going to bed. Anybody who wants to stay, just crash on the floor. Uh, so we'd sleep on the floor and then we would get up and we'd, we'd have breakfast or whatever and we'd resume talking about martial arts. So a lot of the a lot of the those other aspects came during those times because in the class it was always work, but you yeah. know when when you're hanging out with these guys, uh, uh, you know say Sifu Richard's house because he's a Hawaiian he's a Hawaiian boy you know great luau's and you know just luau type parties and so when you're hanging out with these guys, and you're just talking about this stuff this is where all of this. Yeah. This material feeds out. I mean, all these guys were, were at my twenty-first birthday party. I mean, everybody. Right. Yeah. You know, the JD guys, uh, Ben Lagusa and his two top guys. You know, from the Kali group. Yeah. They all helped me bring in my twenty-first birthday. So it was well, that. You, you, as you were saying that, I was thinking of the pictures on your Facebook page of even your wedding. Yes. That looked. That looked like a party too. Oh, it, it was, you know, and it was like, it was like, yeah, you know, you had, you had Dan, you had Richard, you had Jerry Poteet, you had Tony Luna. Um, God, I'm trying to remember everybody who's there. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um, because they were my big brothers. Mm -hmm. Again, they were my big brothers. They were my, my friends. Jerry was one, was one of, if anybody, actually, I, I, I go back to what you were saying before. If anybody treated me like an older brother more, it was actually Jerry. And in fact, in in one of my 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 hard copy Dow of Jikundo that everybody I have signed, um, Jerry wrote, you know, Chris, my little brother, in there, yeah. and said something. And and uh, I mean, again, it's one of these things where we would go over to Jerry's house in El Monte on on Sundays. And we would barbecue, and Jerry would be making equipment or burning, burning sticks for Dan for the for the Philippine arts. And and again, that's when this, this, you know, I don't know, interfusion of the martial art, the ideas behind it, would just all come bubbling out. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So ten. Okay. So ten years in the backyard. No, no, it was only one year because the Kali Academy opened. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, yeah, I would, I would, I would, I'm, I'm doing the the, yeah. the Kali Academy to the IMB, right? So one year in the backyard, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, now you get sophisticated and you move into a building, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so now you've sold out and gone commercial. Well, again, you got to look from historical context. You're going to know what you're looking at. Originally, okay, the idea, like if you look at the membership codes that I got when I began training, I've got, you know, a couple of them, and, and it says, um, there's a green one, though, and then I've got another one, which I don't have, and it says Filipino American Escrima Academy. Yeah. And they originally opened it as an Escrima Academy mm -hmm. with the idea of being able to research the the philippine arts and then at the same time have the jkd class going and, and keeping that going right but uh, and and hence that's the the idea of the 
A, the Filipino Kali Academy, and B, the why the word Jeet Kune Do never appeared on the outside. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, it's one of those things that most people don't understand that the original idea was well, we want to keep the JKD going as well, but, but Dan and Richard really wanted to explore the, the Filipino arts. Yeah. So that's what they did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, w w without without d delving into anything controversial mm -hmm. or what have you, um, in hindsight, was that? Ah, no, forget it. Because no, no, right, I mean, because was that a good idea or What's not? That? The, 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 the idea of, okay, we'll keep the JKD, um, we'll keep the class private, you got to be voted into the class, and we'll mm -hmm. promote these Filipino arts and what have you. I, I, my, if somebody asked me the question, my answer would be, um, it, it was a good idea, but it wasn't thought through. And I think it's because nobody had, nobody knew that Bruce Lee was going to become the phenomenon that he did in 1974. Okay. Right, you know, yeah. What, yeah. What's your what's your your take? Because your take will be much more intelligent than mine. No, no, you, you have you have good points there. The the again, the thing was is this is what they wanted to do. Uh, Dan is an intrepid explorer. Okay, um, so you know, some people might say, you know, wonderful idea, not so great execution, whatever it was. But it was it was a good idea because it was. It was done with with the idea of being able to do that, um, continuing the Jeet Kune Do, because when Bruce died, uh, and I called Dan immediately, and then a couple of weeks later, he wasn't sure he was going to continue. He was just going to can it all, yeah. and it was it was it was people like Daniel Lee and Richard Bastillo, and then also the the note that he got from from Steve McQueen. Mm -hmm. that he used to have on the school, which I know that you've seen about, you know, Bruce did his own thing. He would want you to do your own thing. Yeah. And, 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 and I think it was Dan, Dan Lee and, and Richard who were, were stressing the, the thing about, man, this is too good to let it just go, you know? Um, and so th that's why they did that. And then the, the idea was, became the, the, four levels that you would go, a person would go through to eventually be accepted into the Jeet Kune Do class, okay? Right. And Dan, Dan being a school teacher, when he did it, he said, look, we're going to make it like, we're going to make it like going to university, Soft, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. And each succeeding level will build upon the previous level. You know, so like mathematics, whatever, you know, algebra one, calculus, trigonometry. So everything would build and then take you to the level where if you showed the dedication um, and if you showed the mental attitude, then the JKD class would, your name would be put forth and you could be voted into that class. That's the initial way that changed down the road. Mm -hmm. I, so, I wonder, uh, what, what about the physical aspects of that? Levels one through four, and then being voted into the JKD class. I think right. people hear that and they automatically assume that what you were actually training was also different. Yeah, um, this... Part of this confusion comes about because of the idea, um, you know, there's there's this thing about what well, Dan made a promise to Bruce that he wouldn't do this or he wouldn't do that. The what I was told coming up and again from being there at the time was that Bruce had told Dan, look, you could probably make a lot of money by teaching Jeet Kune Do, but I would be disappointed in you if you did not. You mustn't do this and you mustn't do that because that was not Bruce's nature, according to, to Linda. But it was like, I'd just be disappointed. So Dan kept that in his mind. 
And maybe he thought, maybe he decided that, well, I'm making a promise to him. But, you know, so that was the whole idea. So then to build people up to that level, you can't just take somebody off the street and throw them in the JKD class. So they created these levels or phases, whatever you want to call them, in which they were learning the basics. The big problem to me stems from the fact that you know, at the time they were told that they weren't being, they weren't, they were not learning Jeet Kune Do. Right. Now, you're not being taught Jeet Kune Do. But if you looked at what they were doing, they were doing the same things right. that you were doing in the Jeet Kune Do class. Mm -hmm. So was it more a thing of, uh, in order to, to again, hold to that, that promise or that, that idea. Yeah. Um, and then, then, Dan thought you had to be at a particular mental level, but you were doing the same thing. And right. so that kind of created, I think, some misper misperceptions, if you will. Yeah. You, you said something very interesting just now. You said you couldn't take a person off the street and drop them into that JKD class. But that's mm -hmm. what they did with you in the backyard. But they knew I had a martial art background. Yeah. They yeah. Knew I had they knew I had a martial art background. Okay, what I'm talking about is is somebody like just straight off the street, right? You mm -hmm. have to remember too. This was a backyard class where hey, you're out, get out, and you're done. And then you had a school which still followed the same thing, but you had you had you know rent to pay and things like that. Right. Um, so yeah, there could be the same the same analogy there, but the the idea was one of the things that that I always remember. It was that Dan Dan you know would say that Bruce would always say you know keep the keep the uh, the standards high keep the membership small whatever it was things like that yeah you know um, yeah uh, that kind of idea he was just about quality that was the thing and and so you you want to be able to trust somebody too you, the the time you see this person growing up. You, you know their character. And that was another thing that was stressed to me. You know, if you have to choose between character and ability, you choose character because you can develop and train ability, but you can't yeah. train character. So, uh, okay. So three questions. Have you always kept to that? Or have you ever, um, because you were so impressed by somebody's ability, um, you went against your instinct or better judgment? No, I have to say no. I have to say okay. no on that because I don't care. Excuse me. I don't care how talented they are. If they're an, if they're an asshole, I don't care. I don't want anything to do with them. You know, the world is filled with those. They're a dime a dozen. Um, so I would have to say that no, I've kept to that. And if I've ever made a mistake where I've kind of gone through that, mm -hmm. then then I've removed them. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. No. Yeah. Okay. Here anymore. No. Yeah, I, I I think I've I've seen I've seen you do that where you know you've made statements about you know just statements to clear the air on something and 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 so that everybody understands what's what and who's who. Um, I just thought of something. You said you were number sixteen on a waiting list for the backyard. I've heard that there was also a waiting list at the Kali Academy. Uh, yeah, yeah. It became the Mecca, you know, no no offense to anybody. It became, you know, it's like it's like Gold's Gym became the Mecca for bodybuilding, right? Right, yeah. Everybody came from around the world. The Filipino Kali Academy, it became the Mecca for Jeet Kune Do. It was the only place at the time. Later on, you know, like when Dan gave Larry Hertzel permission to do stuff. Yeah. I mean, I saw people give up careers, give up their houses, move from foreign countries yeah. in order to be here and to do that. You know, it, it had it had such a magnetic draw for people. Yeah. So, yeah. So, OK, so so you're literally becoming an adult surrounded by this phenomenon. Um, can, can you, can you articulate in any shape, what kind of an effect that had on you? Like one thing I'm particularly interested in, in, in knowing is 
Um, so years later, when you're off on your own, what mm -hmm. did you take from those years, right? Those 14 years or, or what have you, backyard mm -hmm. to Kali Academy, then to, to um, you know, the Kent Institute and what have you. Can, can you articulate on, on some of the stuff that you took with you or, and then also, what is it like to become an adult in that environment? Oh man. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just thinking that, uh, cause I, you know, I'm thinking back. Well, well, again, let me say, let me say this. Okay. Because I, this is the way I usually explain it. It was Bruce Lee who ignited my passion for martial arts. Okay. Yeah. It was Dan and Asanto who nurtured that flame and helped it develop and grow and taught or helped teach me, helped me to become a teacher. Okay. Yes. Because at that time he was, he, when, when I was training with him, he was very much more of a coach, if you will. But his ability to teach, I, you know, that's something that I absorbed by standing, you know, arm around each other's shoulder or his arm around my shoulder. Sometimes in the middle of class, he would walk over to me. This is how I learned to teach. He would walk over to me and, he, and then he just put his arm around my shoulder. And then he'd go, all right, see the guy over there? What's he doing wrong? You know? And then I would have to observe and explain. You go, good, now go and explain it to him. You know, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. what, I drew, what I drew was that um, the, the, whole, the whole understanding of Jeet Kune Do, you know, of what it was, that it is a process, not a product. That was, that was, those were things that were hammered, hammered or hammered home, if you will, were, were just constantly being reaffirmed. You know, this, this whole thing of if you understand motion, you don't need style, things like that. Um, if you understand it and you can use it, it belongs to no one. It's yours. Those were things that were continually, you know, mm -hmm. look, this is about you. This is about yeah. cultivation of you. So... As, as you talked about him coming up to you and putting his, his arm around your shoulders and what have you, um, again, for people who might not know, you traveled with him as mm -hmm. uh, assistant and, and training part, demo partner and what have you. Did y'all ever rehearse for that stuff? No. no. I knew it. <laughs> no, I can remember one time uh, because we when we did demonstrations, a lot more – we would do a lot more of the Filipino martial arts because of its mm -hmm. eye appeal. And, you know, Dan's like, well, what are we going to show with JKD? We hit the focus up. We did that at times yeah. too. Hit the focus up, kick, glove up and spar, trap, whatever. Um, the, the, I only remember one time him ever saying we're going to rehearse a demo. And then it went poof. <laughs> uh, and so he just, he just threw it out the window. Right. Because it was not, no, yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't like, like that. Yeah. Know? So no, nope. you know. So same thing when when you're with him on, on a seminar, you you're on the spot because you don't know what he's going to ask for, and and then later for those people who are more with the Filipino arts, with there's there's all these different terms and different dialects and you know. So what I learned is like ordebis down and ordebis up. Somebody refers to bulon down and bulon up, and Dan's going, "Okay, Chris, give me bulon," and I'm looking at him like, "What?" <laughs> huh? Because the yeah. terminology. Right. Um, yeah. So no, there was there was no rehearsing. You just did it. That's that's so cool. Cause I mean, cause that's just as as I would say, going with the flow. You, you know. Yeah. Um yeah. okay, I gotta ask you about a, a particular guy, Jeff Amata. When did Jeff Amata come along? God, I think Jeff came in about 75, maybe. Um okay. I, I can't remember, but very early, you know. Worked his way up through the through the levels, mm -hmm. or, or whatever, and and then became a great training partner in the in the yeah in, in the class. I I have so many amazing memories of of Jeff, you know, yeah. and seeing that, and and at the same time he was paying his dues in the film industry. You know, now he's one of the most you know 
accredited um, choreographer, uh, well, not choreographers, stunt coordinators, coordinators. And unit directors. Hell, I remember when he was doing background work on on Magnum or whatever. The you know the guy paid his dues. Yeah. So um, so yeah, I think it was about seventy five. 1975 when he came in somewhere around there you know okay okay no. um full instructorship 1982 mm -hmm. huh yeah right mm -hmm. okay uh was that a big was it a big deal was it was it just was it like come up and put his arm around your shoulders and and give you a certificate or or, or i mean what was that like dude it wasn't even that <laughs> It's not that it's not that it didn't mean anything, okay? Yeah. Because it was amazing, but again, you have to remember at the time, nobody cared about any of that stuff. Right. the The actual first certificate I ever got in my years of training with Dan came from Angel Cabalas in the Serato system because mm -hmm. it was one of the major ones that Dan was doing when I first began with him. The Serato and the the, the Leo Jarones, the Defondo and the, the Largo. In fact, that's like the second certificate I got, um, instructor certificates and things. Nobody cared about that. Um, yeah. I have a certificate that Dan just again walks up and hands me. But uh, it was like 1977, and it says, you know, Chris Kent has completed 576 hours of training in Jeet Kune Do. And you're like, okay, good, put it away. Right. So the full instructor certificates, it didn't mean, like I said, that it was was not incredible. But no, the way it came about was I went to the, the Kali Academy to work out. And as I walk in the door and see Dan, and he goes, oh, yeah, by the way, there's something in the office for you in there. So I go into the little office, and Bud, Buddy Thompson's sitting in there. And I said, uh, oh, you know, Dan said there's something in here for me. And... And Bud re opens the drawer, pulls out his arm, and goes, "Yeah, here." Just tosses his envelope at me. So I open it, and there's there's two certificates, you know, one in the you know, the JKD, whatever, a John Fun JKD, um, John Fun Martialist, and the other was in the Filipino Collie Academy. I mean, Collie Academy. And I yep. go, "Oh yeah, that's great." Suck him back, put him in my bag when I'm worked out. Right. So that was the the nonchalance, if you will. Um, the, the biggest ceremony that I, I did was for my Escrimador certificate, in which we, uh, myself and Ramon Valdez, who did it at the same time, we had to do a bunch of stuff, a candlelight ceremony, and we had to do, you know, that was a, that was a whole to-do. Yeah. But the, no, the other stuff was just like, all right. Um, the same with the, the membership card that Dan, that I have that has... Dan's signature, or that he signed, and and he's got Bruce's signature on it. I was just at his house one day, and uh, we're doing stuff, and he's going through files. He had huge file cabinets in the libraries, and, and he just turns around and says, oh, here, this is for you. And it was that one of those original John Fon membership cards that had Bruce's signature on it, and he had signed it, and he had yeah. put my name on it and life member on it. So, Do, do you know if when it came to certificating, was 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 it as nonchalant between Bruce Lee and your seniors as well? I that I couldn't tell you because I don't know how they were literally given out or what, you know. There's there's a lot of controversy over who got what and, and when and how and which I don't know and I don't really care about. Um, I honestly couldn't say because I don't know how he did it. Um, yeah. You know? um, I do. The only person I know that I can say was that, that um, when I was director of security of the Buffalo Club in Santa Monica, I met uh, Chad McQueen several times, who's Steve McQueen's son. Mm -hmm. And we talked and I told him what I did. And so we had some good conversations. And he goes, Oh, yeah, I, I still have my dad's certificates somewhere or certificate and he goes yeah he goes bruce just gave him the certificate so right yeah, yeah. i i ask because i notice that um you know the three certificates that minasano has they all have the same date right well so it, it you know 
I I don't know, and there's there's a there's honestly there's a lot of controversy over that, and and quite honestly, I don't care. It does, yeah. I know I know what's what, um, when that came about, how that came about, um, they're just avenues that that I won't go down because they're they're primarily political. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, does it really matter? You know, it's like there's you're supposed to have this, you're supposed to have that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, the only yeah. person I can, can deal with is myself on it. So, all right, let's 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 move to uh, eighty eight when you open up in in Venice, right? right? Okay. So now again, um, actually, this is related to something I was going to ask you later. But now you're on your own. So now the book, as they say, stops with you. So you're responsible for curriculum. You're responsible mm -hmm. for certificate in whatever it is that, that's going on right what what was your first step in organizing the kent um academy of martial art well i mean i i opened it i had i'd been teaching privately but i'd had 13 years of putting materials together and and, and seeing how people did it and and i've always loved teaching so so i've studied it i still do so I put stuff together, but I will tell you this is that I have a stack probably about this high now of curriculums, you know, right? that because every time I would sit down and I would try to write it out and I'd get it done and I'd go, oh, yeah, that's great. That's not it. And I'd throw it aside <laughs> um, because we go back to that thing about <coughs> experiential. Yes. And and. It depends what a person is trying to do, you know, if 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 you want nice, neat little categories where, you know, they learn these three locks, they learn those three locks, they, that's not the way I teach, that's not the way I have stuff, yeah, you know, that, yeah. you might as well, okay, might as well, first of all, I have to learn, for example, okay, how to use the lead hand, A, singular, B, combination, A, as attack, B, as a counter, C, with footwork, with timing, with distance, that's how that's how my curriculum goes. You mm -hmm. know, now combining the lead hand and lead foot. Um, you know, again, same thing from foot to hand, from hand to foot, from foot to hand to foot. Two motion A B C, three motion A B C. Um, you know, uh, closing distance, opening distance. That's yeah. how my curriculum is. Right. Okay. Now that makes perfect sense to me. Okay. Um, and I, but. It makes perfect sense to me because I came along 10 years after you did. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But now, but there are people who are trying to put stuff together by technique, Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. You're putting stuff together by principle. Mm -hmm. So, so, so why, how come, what was it? that clued you into the fact that it's not by technique, it's by principle. Because that's the way I was raised. I mean, <laughs> that's the way I was raised in Jeet Kune Do. This is a process, not a product. This is a principle-centered art. The principles will help you define or find the technique, and then the technique should be a practical illustration of those principles. If they don't match up, something's wrong somewhere. Yeah, That's but the way it came up. Okay, let me devil's advocate a little bit on, on that. Um, and, but then somebody says, yeah, okay, I hear what you're saying, Chris Ken, but that's so esoteric, man. I, I, I just wanna, I, I wanna really understand. They say that to you, what do you say back to them? I say, do you really wanna understand or do you want everything again, just put in nicely little packages so you don't have to think about it? Because the idea is if you are trying to train or not even like to use the word train if you're trying to help people cultivate into free thinking liberated martial artists mm -hmm. then you've got to help them develop the mentality or cultivate the mentality that is going to allow them to be that and you cannot do that by having all these nice neat little things you know where it's this way it's it's why i have such a problem with so much of the educational system today <laughs> Because I was it's, just... it's rote memorization. Right. Yeah. 
I was just going to go there and ask you, how does somebody like you with that type of mindset survive or cope in a world, right, today where it's like you go to the professor and you go, okay, what are the best books to read? I don't, I don't want I, I, I want how – how do you cope? How do you handle that? Well, again, from learning teaching, there are, there are people who are referred to as autodidacts. I think my brother was one. These are people who uh, learn better by themselves. They do not work well in an educational environment. And for years, they were considered troublemakers, rebels. And uh, um, what it was is they were bored because of the educational system. Yeah. You know, because the educational system was designed in like 1902 or something way back then. And a lot of it still hasn't changed okay. with standards and things like that. So you have individuals. I look at Bruce as an autodidact. For sure. He did the learning by himself, which doesn't mean that you don't use anybody's expertise or whatever. It's just that that is the style of learning that works for you. You know, my brother walked out of classes because he was bored. He goes, you know what? I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. You know? um, so, you know, did, you know, did, did, so did you ever, did you ever have the, the, did you ever have the, the, the inkling to do that, but not the courage to do it? I never had the inkling to do it because unfortunately I followed behind him a year in school and I would walk into a class unfortunately with the same teacher and they would call my name and then look at me and they go, do you have a oh. brother named John? Oh, no. I would go, should I just leave now? You know, oh, things like man. that. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he told he told one teacher, you shouldn't be in here. You should. He was a track coach, too. And um, because the this was an individual who was racist at the time. And, um, and my brother goes, you know, you shouldn't be in here. You should just go back and teach track because you're racist. You're gearing everything towards this. And he just walked out. I got the guy the next year. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Not, you know, not really, not really. So, you know, that's the thing about learning to teach and, and studying and, you know, what staying up with teaching, learning styles. We know that we, there are people are three different types of learners, a visual, an auditory and a kinesthetic. Okay. And you will usually be one, maybe two at the most, never three. So yeah. if you have a visual learner and you are bombarding them with verbiage, you're going to lose them. Yeah. And then, the, you know, so this is learning to teach. So now how are you going to have all of these, these nice, neat little packages that says you do this? Um, I mean, trap, you know, the, the, the understanding of hand immobilization attack is the primo example that I love to use with regard to that. Because every time I look around, yeah, there's, Technique, 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 you know, ping choy, gua choy, jiao sao, jump, double jutsa, inside pop. And you go, it's not going to work. One, two motions. But are you doing the action because of the energy and the feel from the mm -hmm. opponent? Or are mm -hmm. you doing it because that's what you were taught? Here is a series. Here is the pop sao series. Here is the lop sao series. Now, if somebody wants to do that, that is their choice. I'm not, it's not up to me to say yay or nay. It is not mine. I could not do that because it's, it's what is the energy that you feel? What, what type of thing is this person giving you? Because yeah. that's how I, I, I developed. Yeah. No? So, yeah. Is, is it possible to devise a method for teaching people to provide the energy for a specific learning experience? Yeah, I mean, that's part of it, for example, with, with the hand mobilization. You, in order to develop that, you have to have a feel of the types of energy that a person can happen. So it's about creating an experience. It's no different than teaching a person how to slip a punch. That is an experience, and that experience is relating to the speed of the punch and the angle of the punch that is coming in. So you create an experience that allows the person to find it and feel it. And mm -hmm. this goes back to where you cross-reference. If you, if you really understand the philosophical foundations, 
the Jeet Kune Do is built on. This whole thing about, you know, discover truth for yourself. My truth is, may, is not your truth. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to end up with completely different truths. It simply means that in order for you to really understand it, you have to experience that truth, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Sugar Ray Leonard could come in and show, or Floyd, Floyd, uh, sorry, Floyd Mayweather could come in and show you know, your class how to fire this jab and how to do this. Until they take that and work that and experience it yeah. and experience the truth of it, it won't mean anything to them. Okay. So that's the learning. That's the learning process. It's a lot harder. I mean, I'll tell you right now, it's to me, it's a lot more difficult because I uh, sometimes when I get in a really pissed off mood, I think, you know, I could just go in and just teach them this and this and this and just phone it in, you know. And, and, and I often say when I'm sometimes when I'm teaching a seminar, if I if I wanted to, I could teach you nonstop stuff for like five years. Yeah. But what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So. It, in in that in that process, um, hmm. if if I want if I want to develop someone, I want to give them an experience of something. Where does drilling, specific drills, play a role, as opposed to sparring? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah. Yeah. You know. So, like, what does one come first? Do they come at the same time? Mm -hmm. How? What? What's? What's the Chris Kent approach? Well, they don't have to necessarily follow in se sequential order. I have, I have, I break it down to I have um, performance development drills, and then I have performance enhancement drills, and they're connected, but they're very different, you know. And and that that comes from the idea of the three stages of technique training. You know, the first stage or four. Sometimes it's written in, in the notes as three, sometimes it's four. Right. Yeah. But the you know the synchronization of self, that is where you are learning the motion. You're developing the body mechanics of that motion. Mm -hmm. You know, things like that, how to move your body, how to transfer the weight. That's the the how. Yeah. Then stage two is now you're progressively amping up the speed and you're working with you know like training partners. On, on drills where you're enhancing the, the speed, the timing of it, but you're not necessarily, you're not sparring, but the, the level is going up, right? Mm -hmm. and, that's the, and then the sparring is to develop the timing, the awareness and the, 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 the butterfly instincts and, you know, things like that. Right. Um, but so, the, so they're not separate. I think what happens so, so much is that because of what I see, is that any drill you you take? It's like if you look at a boxer, you know they might slip, but that drill has got to be taken up in intensity and speed to combat speed and com combat power. Mm -hmm. Where if you make a mistake, you're gonna damn well know about it. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Oftentimes it sits right in the middle and never goes any further than that. So where it's okay, well, we're doing this drill. You know, da, da, ba, 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 you know uh, ba, 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 ba. what the hell is that? You know, where's, for want of a better term, the emotional content? Where's mm -hmm. the intention behind that? It doesn't even matter the speed with which you do a drill. And this is something that, that I did learn um, from being with Dan, or I, I developed after being with Dan and, and doing it. And that's... You know, you may slow, you may you may put the punch out like this speed when they're initially getting it. Boom, right? Okay? And then it's picking up speed, and then it's picking up power, and then it's changing the distance, and then it's things like that. So it goes up and up and up. So you might start here, but this is where you want to get them. But how do you get them from there to there? What is the 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 clearest, straightest line? And then it's got to be the individual, too, yeah. because they may not have it. And again, this is something that I think has been uh, one of the parts that's been neglected with JKD is who are you? What is your nature? What is your physical nature? What is your psychological nature? If you if you are an individual who is not 
aggressive per se, doesn't yeah. want to engage, doesn't, you know, then being a counterfighter is maybe more of your nature, you know? Somebody who's like, no, oh, man, I'm really aggressive. They just want to bang. Good. That's their psychological nature. So, you know, you have their physical nature, you have their psychological, you have their mental nature, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Things like that. That's why it, again, it is about personal cultivation. So. Does that make, does that make it then inherently more difficult to be a Jeet Kune Do instructor as opposed to somebody who's teaching a, a traditional art? I think so. I've, again, I've often said, damn, I, sometimes I wish I was teaching a traditional art because I know I just go in and I do this and this and this and this and this. Yeah. And then, you know, and then they do that. And then we do do this. Um, yeah, you know, again, my approach when I'm even teaching is what is the experience I want to give these students? What is it I want to feel, learn, understand? What is that? Then I reverse engineer it. I back engineer it to, uh -huh. cover to get there. Right. So, you know, then it works or it doesn't work. And sometimes you have to change track or tack in the, in the middle of it and go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and again, it's if you if you look at, do you remember the black, uh, yeah, I think the black belt brought out that Bruce Lee special edition right after he, he passed away. It's a thin book and it's got people like Dan and Daniel Lee and Richard Basile talking about Bruce. And then it's got actors like Steve McQueen talking about Bruce, right? Yeah, remember, I, uh, yeah I've probably seen it, yeah. 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 Um, Linda to the front. Well, the section where Dan is relating, you know, his relationship with Bruce and stuff is right at the beginning of it. He's, uh, he points out that he goes, that, that Bruce made the comment to him, Dan, you try to teach too much. This is not karate. This is not Kung Fu. The best thing you can do for your students is guide them to find the things, give them experiences that either allow them to or force them to find it. So that's all, see, again, that's always been something that's stuck in my head. Right. Is that, okay. And then, like I said, they're like flowers. They don't all grow at the same height. That goes back to the educational system. Oh, no, we're going to have all this group's going to come through. Oh, and then they're all going to grow six inches. Oh, and then they're all, it doesn't work that way. This person might get it. That person might not. You mm -hmm. know, this person might get the, the, the mental attitude of it better, that person may get the physical, you know. So even even the idea of, you know, when they say, well, that guy's first, that's too much of a generalization now because they may have first hands but slow footwork. They may have first footwork and first kicking but slow something else. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, you know. Um. I want, you just reminded me of something. I, I want to read from your website. Mm -hmm. um, it says, when it comes to JKD, Chris has always operated with a clear sense of purpose, mm -hmm. right? And then it says that Chris sees himself as a link between the various generations of JKD practitioners and as mm -hmm. a bridge between the various groups. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so how, how does one conduct oneself and perform as that link? It depends on the person that you're dealing with. You know, again, it's, as you know, and as whoever's watching knows, quite honestly, Jeet Kune Do is one of the biggest, you know, political hornet's nests that's ever existed in martial arts. And I've been in the been in the game so long that I reached a point where I'm like, you know, I don't care about any of this anymore. You know, I've never followed the the, the standings of, you know, these things like original Jeet Kune Do versus Jeet Kune Do concepts. Jeet Kune Do is Jeet Kune Do. And again, you either get it or you don't. Right. Um, so, like I said, I've never followed that. The idea is to educate people. And I don't, again, I don't care if you're a JKD concepts person. I don't care if you're that person. All I care about is helping you understand it and see it clearly. And you either will or, you know, again, there are some people, no matter what you zealots or whatever no matter what you tell them it's not going to change them so i gave up long ago trying to you know it was very hard 
to step back from trying to be like, as John Little used to say, you can't be the JKD policeman all of the time. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I can work with anybody, you know, from any faction, it doesn't matter to me because I don't care about the factions. I just care about the, the art and the information. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, since we are talking about, about factions and, and what have you, mm -hmm. um, so Richard Bustillo, Daniel Lee, Bob Bremer, Pete Jacobs, Jerry Poteet, these guys are your classmates. Mm -hmm. um, how did you meet Taki Kimura and Ted Wong? I met uh, both of them from the, the, they came to the Collier Academy. First time, I forget when, when Taki came. It was in the eight, early 80s, you know, maybe 1980. But Taki came down and I met him there. Um, and then I became much more um, connected with Taki when we started the Bruce Lee Foundation later right. on. I mean, I saw him several times between then. Ted Wong, I became connected with because he used to train with Herbie Jackson at Herb's uh, house mm -hmm. in Marina del Rey. And I lived in Santa Monica. And then, you know, we had the school. Um, that actually, it's before that, the, uh, the Anasanto Academy. So that was a couple of times I went over and, and worked out with, with Ted and, and Herb at Herb's house. Um, but I met, I think I met Ted the first time at, at the, the Kali Academy. You know, when he was there for some for some reason. But again, it's it's these are these were amazing people. They you know it's to to share space on and time on this planet with them. Yeah. You know, it's like and and you know you've met them, so you know um, it's it's that type of thing. And and for me, it was again, it was all about the art. It's not this person or that person. Right. You know. Yeah. Everybody has everybody has a piece of the puzzle. Nobody has the whole puzzle. You know, it's like the moment you give you give one person the keys to the kingdom, mm, no. No. <laughs> so so what I would do if I was researching something, right? Yeah. For example, even related to Chicken Do, the way I relate it is, okay, so you've got Bruce Lee doing something in the middle of the room. This is just conjecture, obviously. You got Bruce Lee doing something in the middle of the room. In one corner, you've got Jerry Poteet. Another one, you've got Tim Tackett. I mean, uh, yeah, it could be Tim, but let's mm -hmm. say it's Richard Stillo. You got Dan, Dan over here. Uh, somebody else, maybe Taki over here. Bruce does something. They all see the same thing, but they see it from a slightly different perspective or angle. Yeah. So now, if I go to those four people, and three of them all confirm one thing and the fourth person somebody out in the left field i know something's wrong or something's not correct there so the idea is okay so if, but if they all see the same thing but from a slightly different perspective because that's part of what bruce would do right he would mm -hmm. he would teach according to all of these guys and he would do it to what worked for you so you know that's always been my approach at looking at something it's never just to blindly take one person's opinion on it. That right. leads to dogma. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that is that is really dangerous. Um, you talked about research, and I mean, you've mentioned research more than once in our sixty-three mm -hmm. minute conversation. Uh -huh. um, is it your um, continuous research and study? Like it says in uh, to, to this effect, words to this effect on your website, continuous research and study not just in martial art, but you mm -hmm. know in in things like coaching and neuroscience and what have you. Is right. that what led to the TEDx talk? Um, in Ohio? Well, what, yeah, yeah. What led to it was I have been I have been wanting to um, because as I said in in my book I've been, I've been wanting to to take these principles, you know, the be like water, the using no way is way, great. And how do you, how do we take that again and associate it in our regular life? I've been wanting to do it for years, and I had 
tons of notes on it and was was always researching that. And then, you know, as you know, for, for several years, John Little was up here in, in Idaho too. Mm -hmm. So we would have these mammoth, I mean, it was incredible. We'd have these mammoth three and four hour philosophical discussions and over at his house and we'd be looking at stuff and we had Bruce's library here. Did y'all turn a camera on when you did that? No. Oh man. No. No, it was we drank a ton of coffee, I can tell you that. You're you're just two old farts. That's that ne never that it has to go anywhere. It doesn't have to be published, but you but you should have just had that. Oh, I know, but we yeah, again, we didn't think about it because we were just <laughs> fun. Um I, and John as I've said before and I'll, I'll state it I'm categorically. I think John Little understands what Jeet Kune Do is more than 99% of the people in the Jeet Kune Do world. And he has no horse in the race yeah. in it. But we would have these discussions and, and different stuff. And, and he knew I was doing this and going through. And, and finally, after a period of time, you know, I would talk to him about doing it. And he's like, well, Chris, you just got to sit down and do it. Now's the time. So he was kind of like a, an impetus. So I was like, you know, you're right. And, and so I did it. But it was like, how do you, like I said, how do you take that? What does that, what does that idea mean? Yeah. Um, that had always a, appealed to me since I began training in Jeet Kune Do. And part of that, again, was from, from reading Bruce's notes and, and talking with these guys and, and Linda. Linda was a, is, not was, is an amazing human being, you know, and offered me so much insight into into Bruce and his nature and um, so one thing that I, I I feel super super um, grateful for is that from growing up with Dan, all the guys like Richard, Jerry, and Bob Bremer, Ted, Taki, and Linda, I I think I've got a I got a really clear picture of Bruce as a total human being. So I've never had this put him up on a pedestal as a Right. As a you know, yeah, he might genius level in this, but you know, the man couldn't boil water to save his life. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I said, so doing that study, doing that, doing the book, um, uh, my friend Greg Smith, who is a uh, a business executive, he's he's a, a vocal coach. He teaches leadership. He was an executive of the TEDx Youngstown. Uh, approach me and said, um, I'd like to invite you to to do a, a, a TEDx talk. Yeah. And I said, wow, okay, that that's pretty amazing. And so I agreed to it. And then they sent us what the theme of the, the whole, there were 17 speakers there, and it was an incredible experience. Um, but there was a particular theme, life happens. And so you had to, you know, come up with a, with a, uh, a theme for your talk and right. so, as you know i chose so so is it fair to say you had to somehow synthesize 50 years of experience into 12 minutes yeah <laughs> what, I, what i had to do was, what I, had to do was choose, I, I had to choose one of yeah. so many categories <laughs> right. that i could have chosen um, but that one always just struck me because of my own learning. Again, see, we're back to the education system because in the talk I talk about that, how you, I came up through the educational system. And, and that one, I guess, just, you know, hit a heartstring. And I said, no, no, I want to talk about that. And, and, and also because having a daughter and seeing her come through the educational system and seeing a lot of people um, just struggling because – because of that, that that this just gave me a new approach to learning, so that's why it became important to me. But yeah, it's to 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 to, to trim everything down, even just that one thing with four things. My first draft came out twenty two minutes, you know, and then, <laughs> and then it went down to like eighteen minutes, and then it went down to like sixteen minutes, and. Yeah, so it was hack away the non-essentials. Right. Of yeah. Things. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so I mean, so you literally experienced the JKD experience 
in preparing for this thing. 100%. And, you know, the, the um, having That's, to overcome, overcome the obstacles, barriers. Can I do this? Do yeah. I know what I'm talking about? Is, yeah. is this worthwhile? Yeah. Yeah. I came face to face with all of that. It, yeah. it was a, an incredible experience. Yeah. Would, would, would you recommend that people try to do that even if they're never going to do a TEDx talk? In other words, if you're if you're somebody who is walking around with a ton of JKD material thoughts and processes and whatever in your head, mm -hmm. but you've never committed it to writing or whatever, would you recommend that people do that? I would recommend it to them if they felt that they they could. There are some people that can't do that. But, you know, it's like uh, everybody loves to tell you journal, 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 journal. You know, journal. There are right. some people that cannot do it. It's not in their nature. Maybe if they spent years or whatever trying to learn it, but they're not used to it. Um, so, yeah, write it down, talk it into a tape recorder, put it on video, what, whatever. Kind of like mm -hmm. you were saying with, with John and I. Because, yeah. you know, when one sheds this mortal coil, um, when you're gone, you're gone. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, but, but again, it has to be what is, what is in their nature to, to, to do it. Some people, they just can't do it. They can have it all and they can do it. It's just like the same thing, you know, how they talk about, uh, there are fighters and there are teachers and, uh -huh. you know, the usual thing, the usual thing was those who can do those who can't teach. And then you go, really? Well, here's an yeah. idea. I'm going to put you in the classroom. You're going to teach. And then they go, Oh, I can't do that. Oh, oh. Uh -huh. you know, yeah. Um, yeah. Different thing. Uh, again, um, I was, when I grew up under Dan, teaching is an art unto itself. Just like feeding the equipment is an art unto itself. Yes. And, and it's, that's the individual. Yeah. You know? Um, it, 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 but again, what you're talking about sounds to me like, okay, so as an instructor, your 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 role is to help people to develop themselves while you're working on your own development simultaneously. Yeah, exactly. Right? Sure. It's not for everybody, is it? No, no. Either you get it or you don't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I you know I will tell you point blank. There are some days where I go, why do I bother? You know, I just want to go to, uh, is it Tobago where we went that time? Way way back. Oh. Yeah, uh, 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 we went to Trinidad. Trinidad, okay, yeah. yeah we went I just to want Trinidad. to go to Trinidad and sit on a beach and have a cerveza. You know? <laughs> because, you know, um, because it's just, uh, but but there's so much that I love about it. Yeah. So like I said, it becomes this kind of, sometimes you just go, why? Why do we even, and then, then you see the light go on in somebody's eyes when they get something, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's yep. why I do it. Okay. That's why. Yeah. Okay. All right. I had um, I had a list of final questions that I was going to ask you, and then I whittled them down to one. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I, it's from one of your books, and it pretty much says this: Jeet Kune Do isn't so much about asking questions as it is about questioning the answers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Expound on that, and we'll close this up. Well, you know, again, it's it's question the answers. Who said it? Why was it said? What is their background? You know, um, it goes back to that thing when you cease to when you cease to doubt, you cease to question, right? Or when you cease to question, you cease to doubt. Cease to you, doubt. Cease to doubt you cease to grow. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. that, um, it doesn't mean on everything. You, you you know, it's like you're not going against the grain just for the sake of going against the grain because then you're with the grain you know? <laughs> um, right you're you're finding out why you you want to know the why of, of things and if you think about it that's what we are when we're children and then it gets drilled out of us yes because children are natural born scientists they will play they will figure out they will try why something works it doesn't work. Oh, they'll try something else. Mm -hmm. They don't care. They're, and they'll ask why. Being a parent and all those parents who, you know, they're on here. If you're a parent, you know, 
I don't want you to do that. Why? Well, because. Why? Well, because in the end, it's usually because I'm your father. That's why. Right? <laughs> right? It's it's uh, it's that that type of thing. Yeah. But um, uh, it you know don't just take things at face value. That's the point. Mm-hmm. Well, question, yeah, of course. You know, you can, you might see something. You don't need to, like I said, you don't question everything because you might look at that and you might go, oh, yeah, that's perfectly feasible. I understand that. Yeah. But if it's not, then ask why. Why is it, you know, that's that's the whole thing, like like the tradition. You know, when, when Bruce comes to America and he sees the people and he steps forward and he goes, why are you training that way? Well, right. Because that's the way we do it. Why? So, so yeah, question, 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 research, but also know what it is that you're looking to, not looking to find, because that's what they call confirmation bias, right? Right? Confirmation mm-hmm. bias is when you start, that's the thing about don't start from a conclusion. You know, confirmation bias is you start with the idea that you want, and then you search for everything that reinforces that idea, and everything that reinforces it you keep, and everything that doesn't you throw away. As that's just garbage. Yeah. Um, so look again. Look at these things. Um, it doesn't matter what your teacher tells you. You know, I'm telling. I'm forever telling my students, don't do it because I'm telling you to do it. Examine it and see why you're doing it that yeah. way. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. So it it's it so it involves also questioning the answers that you come up with for your own self. Yes, yes. Right. And listen, yes, and listen to your students. Sometimes you know, as a, you can become so locked in as a teacher that you fail to listen to your students, and the student might come in, and you go, "Damn, that's brilliant." Yeah, that's great. That mm-hmm. that's what you. That's what. If you're a confident teacher, that doesn't make you any less of a teacher. It makes you a better teacher because you're willing to examine these other people's points of view. And if they had valid points of view, and if they challenge your point of view, maybe you need to look at that, you know? Yeah. 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 All right. Okay, my friend. That's, uh, let's put a wrap on this. Yeah, um, well, you know, we could probably talk for hours because I can talk for hours and hours. Well, and hours. you know, I hey, you know? I I could pull I could pull a, a a John Little with you, you know, if you force me. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, the only thing I have of John is when I had my school well, with my school here. John came in and gave two lectures at my school. That, that oh wow! Did. And what it was was he's he's actually. Um, talking about uh, like a couple of articles that made their way into those Bruce uh, uh, JKD newsletter magazines or whatever uh-huh. it was. Yeah, you know, uh, one was like closing the school in order to reach the students, things like that. But John actually came and Linda came to him because she, you know, in here and um, so he came and just gave this lecture, and then we had a Q and A afterwards, question and answer. For, and I had it not just for my students, but whoever wanted to, whoever was here who wanted to come in could come in and just watch it. So we did that, mm-hmm. you know. Um, you know, so yeah. that's the thing that I have there. You know? Hey, JKD royalty, man. All right? Okay. Uh, All right. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I just, you know, again, I, I, I just like to reiterate that, you know, JKD has given me so much. You know, um, and the, the I mean, everything from the art to the people that I have I have met and I've known. And, you know, I mean, the, not just my big brothers, but the new, you know, the new people, you know. And that's what, you know, just I just want to close this because so often, again, I hear these things like, well, like those are the guys that have got it, you know. Um, well, you know, and I hate to say this and I've said it before when dealing with one particular issue and um, not to be blasphemous, but not everyone who touched the robe of Christ was healed or cured. So <laughs> not everybody who came into contact with Bruce has this wealth of, of knowledge or information, you know, yeah. but, 
but you know, like I said, they they have they may have they may have something. So, like meeting these people, spending time with them, um, is amazing, you know. And I, I think I think God, destiny, whatever anybody wants to call it, mm -hmm. that I I just happen to be in that spot. I mean, come on, Dwight, I wouldn't have known you, man. <laughs> you, know? you wouldn't be having this talk right now. So yep. I, yep. Even the people who are writing in right now, I've met so many of them. Um, and that's what I was saying about the not everyone who touched the robe of Christ was cured, is that, you know, I met people who were whatever anybody wants to call them, second or third generation, you know. I met first generation people, I go, they don't have it. And I've met second and third generation people, I go, they have it. They yeah. get it. Yeah. So I've never been, I don't believe that, oh, you know, it's got to be this. No, right. no, Yeah, it's not automatic at all. No. Right. Yeah. yeah. Nope, nope, nope. All right. So, yeah, so even like I said, some of these people, I don't have my glasses on, so I just see this. That's thing. okay. I see um, over there, but, you know, but like if, and if, Peoria if you wrote in, you know, and he's, I've known Randy for, for a number of years. I mean, a, a bunch of these guys, you know, they're, they're, they're amazing people. Well, I, yeah, I, and they'll show up for you. Well, they better damn will show up for me. <laughs> right? right. Okay. So, um, so if you, if you would, um, when we close this up and it's, it's up on Facebook, if you'd just take a scan through the comments and see if there's anything that, that you need to reply to, or I'll do, I'll do the same thing. Sure. Um, yeah. best place to, to find you though is Facebook, correct? Yeah, I use that. I don't, I don't go on Twitter. Twitter or whatever. LinkedIn's like a business one, whatever. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm not on Twitter or any of those. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know. and the, the I, website is the easiest thing in the world to remember, ckjkd.com. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in the midst of, I pulled a lot of stuff off of it because I'm in the midst of actually redesigning. Just so just so people know, I'm, I'm completely redesigning it, you know, ah. through, through like Wix. So then I could just switch it over. Uh, you and that bloody Wix, man. It, you know, I can work with it. It's like, it's, <laughs> you know, some people are tech, I, just like I tell my daughter, you, my daughter, are a technology native. I'm a technology immigrant. You know, <laughs> I was born into, into this stuff, man. Yeah. So, I, I'm, I'm still. I'm you were brought here. into it. You were brought into it, um, 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 fussing and fighting. Kicking right? and screaming. That's Kicking right. and I screaming. Yeah. Into it, and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Give me my pen. You know, I still write with a pen and paper, though. Doesn't matter. Oh, I, me too. I, yeah, me there's too. There's a feel. There's a feel for it, right? Yep. So, yep. In yeah. fact, um, over the weekend, I'm heading out to to um, to Walmart to get myself a stack of the you know the black and white covered composition notebooks. Yeah, yeah. books. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Got it. A bunch. Yep, yep. I, I that I make my notes for both podcasts when I'm on the train going to private clients during that oh. commute. That's when I do all, all my, all my, all my writing. Yeah. 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 See, I, do mine, I, I do mine at the pub while I'm having a drink. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Listen, man, thanks very much again for spending oh, yeah. some time with me. I appreciate it. Oh, hey, you know, anytime, like I said, it's always a good chat and, and we've known each other for a long time. And, and again, for the people who, who listened in, um, you know, thanks for listening in. Oh, and, I got to tell you this. I was with Inosano a few weeks ago and he uh, went through the room and I was the most senior person there with 40 years. Oh, wow. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you Amazing, know, huh? Tomorrow, today was your birthday. Tomorrow is my 50th anniversary. Nice. So, nice. In, in Chikando. Nice. You know? Congratulations, man. Thanks. Like I said, it's been it's been a hell of a ride. <laughs> I hear you. All right. Okay. Take it easy. Have a great weekend, man. All right. Take it easy. All right. Take care. I don't know how to shut this thing off now, so I'll I'll take care of it for you. Don't worry. Okay. All righty. Okay. Bye. Bye. All right. That's my boy. Episode. Uh, what was that? Two sixty five with uh, Chris Ken. So you guys know where to find him on uh, on Facebook. And uh, like he said, he'll go through the comments and see if there's anything that he needs to um, reply to. All right. So um, that's it for today. Feel free, share, like, comment, 
and uh, and all that good stuff. Follow me on Twitter at Dwight Woods and on Instagram at Dwight D Woods at PayPal.me slash Unified MA Miami is uh, the Kendo Journey Volume One. PayPal.me slash Unified MA Miami. You can also support the program on the YouTube. Uh, the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues YouTube channel. Just click the join link and that's where you'll see the different levels of membership that uh, are available to you. And one more way to support the program is at jkdrebel.com. Click on the Rebel Gear link and that's where you'll see stuff like this. The JKD Notables coffee mug also available in uh, garment form. But of course, the best thing you can do is to share these videos and spread the word about the I love, I love, I do it all the time, about the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues, right? Okay, so um, next Friday, I am, I, I have to confirm it with him. I, I have him in the books. We did discuss it, but I haven't confirmed it. Um, JKD author, counter uh, focus counter violence author, um, Michael Van Beek. I'm hoping he'll be, he'll be available. And uh, we'll, but we'll put that together. So keep your eyes out for that. Until the next episode, this is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebels, signing off. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. No, have a great weekend, and I'll see you uh, next week. Stay safe. Talk soon.